Florence, 1401. 34 men of the Cloth Importers Guild have been summoned to serve as a jury, but no crime has been committed. No lawyers will argue the case. And the only evidence are two gilded door panels depicting the sacrifice of Isaac by his father Abraham. The list of suspects has been narrowed down from seven local artists to just two men. Filippo Brunelleschi and Lorenzo Ghiberti. Instead of reaching a verdict on guilt or innocence, the men of the Cloth Importers Guild will decide which artist will be awarded the commission to contract and design the massive bronze, bronze doors of the eastern entrance to the baptistry of St. John. This competition, which basically was a 15th century Italian version of an HGTV reality TV show, um, was the brainchild of a man named Giovanni de' Medici, founder of the Medici Bank and played by Dustin Hoffman on a Netflix show, so you know he's important. <laughs> the idea was to commission these amazing doors as a literal, oh, thank God, for Florence having been spared the ravages of the Black Death, which had basically killed half of all people in Europe at this point. Definitely a reason to celebrate. Uh, but back to the competition. When Brunelleschi and Ghiberti faced off, they were the two finalists out of a group of men, the last one standing, including prominent Florentine sculptors like Donatello. Each had been required to design and produce a panel in gilded bronze to showcase their skill. We still have the two competition panels on the display in Florence. These are them. The relative merits of the two are still debated by art historians today, but uh, Brunelleschi's is, is more dramatic. It, the angel and Abraham, they're over a contorted Isaac in these violent poses. And Ghiberti, his figures are, are more elegant, more refined, and his panel was more technically accomplished. It used less bronze and so cost less, and the jury was definitely considering that. Now, what happened with the jury's decision, how it all went down, is, is a matter of Frankly, a lot of dispute, but the result was never in doubt. In 1403, Lorenzo Ghiberti officially won the competition. <laughs> what Brunelleschi did next was leave town, and he took Donatello with him. They left Florence and went all the way to Rome, where they lived together for years. Giorgio Vasari, in his Lives of the Artist, written about 100 years after Brunelleschi died, claims that Brunelleschi even sold his family farm to pay for their trip, which doesn't exactly sound like a man that was happy with the jury's decision. Vasari says Brunelleschi went to Rome, quote, because he wished to surpass Lorenzo and Donatello, believing that architecture was more necessary for man's needs than sculpture or painting, you know, those things he'd lost in. Why did Donatello go with Brunelleschi? Quote, Donatello, being then a young man, held in esteem as a sculptor, Filippino began to hold intercourse with him, and such an affection sprang up between them that they, it seemed as if one could not live without the other. <laughs> Have deep discussions? Uh, it's an interesting editorial note from uh, the good men at Oxford World's Classics. Um, <laughs> Brunelleschi and Donatello's years of study in Rome were, were packed with action and excitement. They became treasure hunters, and you know what that means. That's right. We're going to need a montage. <laughs> Brunelleschi's first biographer, Antonio Manetti, actually gives us one. He says, uh, he went to Rome where at that time one could see beautiful works in public places. In studying the sculpture as one with a good eye, intelligent and alert in all things would do, he observed the method and the symmetry of the ancients' way of building. What we also know is that Brunelleschi took exacting measurements of Hadrian's pantheon in Rome. It's a vaulted dome with a hole at the top, built more than a thousand years before Brunelleschi lived, and still a feat in his time of engineering astoundingly beyond the capabilities of his contemporaries. It was a temple devoted to all the gods of Rome, and in studying its vault, something inside Brunelleschi's head just clicked. The moment of epiphany. Mary describes it this way. 
he seemed to recognize very clearly a certain arrangement of members and structure, just as if God had enlightened him about great matters. And so he began to study, using secret codes on strips of parchment and forbidden Arabic numerals, which, you know, is just what you did before patents. Um, and then he describes by his genius, through tests and experiments, with time and with great effort and careful thought, he became a complete master of these things in secret, while pretending to be doing something else. What was the secret craft? What were these tests and experiments? One of the most profound was Brunelleschi's discovery of the principles of one-point linear perspective. By studying the science of how and why the Roman ruins and landscapes appeared to change shape when seen from a distance and different angles. And trying to capture them on parchment, he developed a method for rendering three-dimensional objects in two-dimensional space, you know, <clears throat> on a piece of paper. <clears throat> the key was the idea of a vanishing point, a place on the horizon line where everything converged. But in the earliest days of the 15th century, particularly in Florence, Brunelleschi could not simply make a claim. He had to prove it, which is how sometime before 1413, Brunelleschi carried out his great experiment in linear perspective. To do so, he returned to Florence. He took as his subject the eastern doorway of the baptistry of St. John. <laughs> the very same place where he had been defeated by his rival, Lorenzo Ghiberti. <laughs> it was, in many ways, his own personal vanishing point, the place where everything had converged 10 years before. And so he stood in the entrance to the Florence Cathedral, 115 feet away, and he stared across the plaza at the site of his greatest defeat, and he began to paint. He painted the baptistry and the east door. He painted the plaza. He painted everything within the frame of the doorway to the cathedral. Instead of clouds above the building, he used a piece of polished silver as a mirror. It could reflect the clouds, the birds, even the changing sunlight of the actual sky. And finally, he drilled a hole through the center of the painting right where the mathematical vanishing point was. So if you held the back of the painting up to your eye, you could peek through and see the exact image of what you were trying to capture. To prove the perfection of his craft, he stood in the cathedral doorway, held up the back of the painting to his face with one hand, and with the other would hold up a mirror between him and the building. The illusion was supposedly so perfect that people that saw it couldn't tell the difference between the painting and the building itself. Last known to be in the possession of Lorenzo de' Medici, the Magnificent, the painting itself was lost during the looting of Florence in 1492. But Manetti, Brunelleschi's biographer, writing in about 1480, claimed to have personally held the painting and carried out the experiment himself exactly like this. Even though Brunelleschi's painting was lost, it, it transformed Renaissance art. In 1413, Domenico de Prato refers to him as the perspective expert, ingenious man, Filippo de Ser Brunellesco, remarkable of skill and fame. The techniques for capturing three-dimensional images in two-dimensional space proved critical for Brunelleschi's own later work, building and completing the great dome atop the Florence Cathedral, a task everyone had previously thought was impossible. In 1427, painters like Masaccio would use Brunelleschi's techniques to create the illusion of depth in murals like the Holy Trinity here. In 1436, Leon Battista Alberti, the quintessential Renaissance man who could literally leap over the heads of 10 men in sequence, according to him, uh, <laughs> would dedicate Della Pittura, his definitive manual on the principles of painting, to Brunelleschi. In an era when almost all art was dedicated to Christianity and the church, he also used these techniques and transformed secular art. Uh, with the spread of Brunelleschi's approach, 16th century sword masters like Joachim Meyer were able to capture their techniques with far greater accuracy. Uh, yes, 
even the art of self-defense was transformed by Brunelleschi. Turns out you just kick him in the nuts. <laughs> From the sculptures of Donatello to the inventions of da Vinci, the Sistine Chapel of Michelangelo to the altarpieces of Raphael Urbino, you could say Brunelleschi blazed the trail for the most important group of artists in history. So let's raise a glass to Brunelleschi and linear perspective and the epiphany that created the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> <laughs>